I am so excited to be here to present to um, the Gun Institute for the Gun Exchange. And as it was mentioned, um, my name is Dr. Rachel Oldinsky Floriani, an associate professor in the College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. I am involved in multiple multi um, interdisciplinary programs on campus, eager, of course, to always join more. And given the time and the scope of the audience, I am very excited to present my work on plants under pressure and how we um, design sustainable medical and consumer products. So my lab here at the University of Vermont, the Engineered Biomaterials Research Laboratory, um, is very interested in advancing healing through engineering. Um, one of the programs at the University of Vermont, a PhD program, is bioengineering. And bioengineering encompasses um, multiple programs at UVM, biology, material science, mechanical engineering, and biomedical engineering. And so you put all of that together um, with one of the major motivations of our research, and it aligns with some of the missions of other programs out there. One of those, the Biomimicry Institute, the Bioneers Establishment, um, and then other programs here on campus, both student-driven and then interdisciplinary-driven. So one of the focuses um, of my work as both a principal investigator and a faculty advisor is to support the development and growth of future engineers, scientists, leaders, and entrepreneurs for the advanced healing of our environment, ourselves, and the future of humanity. So here is where I'm going to start talking about um, one of the major motivators for my work, and that is healing the earth and healing ourselves. And this is really a cyclical relationship. Um, in fact, if you look at the picture on the screen, this brings to mind how we're healing ourselves and how we now need to think about healing the environment. So here we're looking at medical waste. These are one-time use medical products that are being fished out of the ocean. And so um, again, one of the drivers for my work is this idea of ecological medicine. And this is um, a collection of work that is presented by bioengineers. And again, how we can look at healing the earth and healing ourselves. And there are a couple of things that I want to point out on this slide in particular. So the first one is that public health is kind of getting a revamp. And when we think about public health, it's important that we think about not only human health, but environmental health, because they are connected. Um, our health is dependent on our housing, our food, um, the air that we breathe, and the waste that we generate. And the other um, really major thrust of today's talk is um, looking at how we can transform the medical industry itself from being a major source of toxicity and environmental harms to something that works with our environment. In fact, 25% of medical waste is plastic, um, harming our environment and actually changing our body because of the plastics that we consume. And in that little picture, you see they are burning medical waste. And that, again, just releases these toxins into our environment. So in the past, here we have a fantastic image by Magano. And here, again, we're looking at how we can incorporate design into healing our environment, right? And so if we can protect our environment, we can protect ourselves. And here the design questions are, how do we protect our children, right? The future generations, how do we protect all those species known and unknown? And how do we do this all of the time? And one of the things that I also like is this question, why are we always leaving, right? Like, why are we moving? Eventually we won't be able to escape the decisions that we are making today. And so on the top right, you can see uh, a quote by McDonald. And he is also the creator of this cradle to cradle design ideology. And here, I'm going to read this because I think it's quite beautiful. And to use something as elegant as a tree, Imagine this design assignment. Design something that makes oxygen, sequesters, sequesters carbon, fixes nitrogen, distills water, makes complex sugars and foods, changes colors with the season, and self-replicates. 
And then what do we do? We knock it down and we write on it, right? And so this is his idea of how do we design even our lifestyle to protect our environment. But there is one thing that hasn't been considered enough and is not made public um, and especially not raising public awareness enough. And that is how we can look at redesigning healthcare. And so one of the things that is um, difficult is changing the consumer mindset. And in this case, a consumer may be a surgeon, right? Imagine yourself being on an operating table. You are probably not going to have a choice of what plastics they're going to use to save your life, right? It's a little bit different than choosing not to use that plastic straw. Uh, one other thing that besides, you know, the 25% of plastic that ends up harming our environment, we also need to understand that a lot of those plastics are dependent on fossil fuels. So if we are make, if we are taking refined products from um, fossil fuels, we're using those to make plastics, and those plastics then are used in a clinical setting by healthcare to save our lives, and then it's producing this waste. And you can see the cyclical cycle that doesn't really fit into this beautiful uh, screen. So let's get to it, right? So the focus of my research really is to work in harmony with nature. And I like to give the example of a symphony on the left, right? You can't really pick out the flute unless you're very talented, but you can't pick out the first chair flute um, if, every, if everything is working beautifully, right? And if all the instruments are working together. And that's sort of my idea, particularly looking at the human body, right? Is there a way where we can learn from nature, right? We, we don't see the trees right, releasing oxygen, but is there a way where we can treat ourselves or we can house ourselves, put clothes on our backs without um, noticeably harming the environment? And so biomimicry designed by nature is a very general term that I use, right? Um, there are many definitions out there, but I, utilize biomimicry ideals um, for three major projects and three lines of research in my laboratory. One of those, and the um, I'd say the biggest source of all of the research in the lab is the idea of preventing medical trauma. The second one is transforming meat culture, which is one of the newest um, projects in the lab. And then last but not least, looking at bio waste textiles. And unless um, we get into this topic during the question answer period, I will not be talking about this aspect due to time. So bio-inspired materials engineering, yes, I wanna make sustainable materials, right? And I still believe that as an engineer, I can make them fancy, I can make them cheap, I can make them usable, all of these things. And the science behind that work is built on a relationship, right? And that is the composition, the structure, and the function of that relationship. So what is the particular function of the material we are designing? What does the structure need to look like in order to perform that function? And then most important is the composition in order to create that structure to perform that function. In particular, when we look at materials, I am looking at natural-based plastics, natural-based polymers, proteins and polysaccharides, designing novel materials from these natural-based materials, um, inducing multifunctionality, just like nature does, right? The, our skin can do multiple things, so can trees. Um, and then the other thing is generating a dynamic response or remodeling ability of materials that we use, thus transforming them from a one-time use consumer product to maybe having multiple uses. So the image on the left shows kelp and it's beautiful, right? And off the coast of Maine, there are actually agriculture companies that are looking at farming kelp and seaweed. And from that, plant, we can get alginate. And so that is going to be the main topic of uh, my research today. And that actually is one of the, the top materials we work with in the lab. And so my goal is to design these smart materials. Well, what does that mean? That just means that they're responsive to their environment, just like everything else that is designed by nature is, right? And by looking at these smart materials, we are able to produce medical products, we're able to produce materials that enhance 
biological research. And most importantly, encompassing all of, all of that, right, um, is to generate sustainable materials and consumer products. So one of the first things that I'm going to be talking about is preventing and transforming medical trauma. And here is where I'm going to start to introduce the idea of plant-based materials as medical products, reducing all of that waste that ends up in our oceans. So one of the problems we have, and I'm looking at a very specific problem, is an injury to the lung, right? And if you have an injury to the lung, it's just like a hole in a balloon, it's going to lose pressure. And actually, because we have a chest cavity around our lungs, our balloons, as that pressure is released from the lung, it actually escapes to the chest cavity, um, preventing that lung from reinflating. Typically, this would require a visit to the ICU if the patient um, didn't pass away before then. And so we want to address um, that problem right away. And the goal was to make it as simple to use as possible for first responders, um, for wounded soldiers out on the field, and also just for everyday use. So as I mentioned before, punctures in the pleural lining in the lung, they must be sealed to prevent leakage and to restore normal respiratory function. There are products out there on the market, actually there's only one, designed to heal lungs. However, there are multiple problems associated with it, with both the use of the material and what the material is made out of. So the current materials, there's rapid cross-linking. So what does that mean? It dunks up in the tube. If any of you have used a tube um, syringe epoxy, you kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. The other problem is that product on the market contains polyethylene glycol that is sourced from oil, from fossil fuels, and it also generates an antibody response in our own bodies. So we actually are immune to some of the materials that they use in drug delivery. So we want to move away from that. And one of the uh, things that I'm going to use is alginate, right? I love alginate. So the chemical structure of the repeat unit of alginate is shown off to the side. And so what we needed to do, our challenge was to create a sealant that behaved like lung tissue mechanically, right? Mechanically, I'm a mechanical engineer. And so I needed to restore lung pressure, right? But I also needed to retain the compliant properties of the lung because the lung can inflate, right? And then it can deflate and it's able to stretch as we go through that physiological movement. So a lot of the products, this particular product is synthesized from alginate. Uh, the goal was to have easy storage, to store this at room temperature, to have a simple application process that anyone could use, and also to have an effective seal. We wanted to do that. And last but not least, if this product ends up being thrown away or it degrades and is removed from the human body, the goal is also to have innocuous products. So not toxic to animals and not toxic to our environment. And there are three, three things that I investigated. So the other thing about um, my research program is I really want to make sure that I have multifunctionality in anything that I design. And so the three different sealant systems that I looked at is a liquid-based product, a patch-based product, very similar to a Band-Aid, and then a powder sealant system. And that's the one that's most exciting. So I'm going to move through some of the basic research rather quickly. It tells a beautiful story, but there's also papers out there that discuss this. But if you look at the top left, that is the repeat unit of our alginate. Through various aqueous and non-aqueous chemistries, we are able to induce multifunctionality into our materials. The one that you see on the top middle, the methacrylated alginate, that allows us to cross-link this material in various ways, thus going from a, an alginate solution to a solid construct, all the way down um, to the very bottom where you see um, a difference in that side functional group. And that allows us to then modify and optimize the mechanical response of our materials. We verify the chemical modification via chemical characterization, but most importantly, can we use this and does it make something? So we take our methacrylate alginate that is able to cross-link with some sort of light source, and 
we use green light. And so that is something that is not harmful to the body um, as opposed to traditional ultraviolet light. Um, so you can see in the very far right, we have our alginate hydrogel, almost looks like a contact lens. Now we can do a lot to that hydrogel, right? We have a lot of options for changing it, but already through this one slide, I've shown that it's light responsive. It's capable of dual cross-linking. We can induce ionic cross-linking in this material and we can make it tissue adhesive, which is useful, useful for some of our work. We go through some mechanical tests. Quantitative analysis is very important to us. Um, in that white square, you can see a testing device that we actually designed in our lab. It's modified from an ASTM standard. But being able to understand the mechanical response of our materials is critical because in the body, um, tissues, organs, they adapt mechanically to what is happen happening. And that actually in turn affects our biology. So we looked at burst pressure, which essentially is how, how much can we blow up that balloon before it burst, right? So the first thing that we looked at is this liquid sealant. It is essentially a glue that we can dispense from a syringe. And in the middle there, if we look at burst pressure, you can see that some of the materials behaved better than others. And what's important is that the, the pressure, the physiological pressure of lungs is about 12 inches of water. So you can see a couple of our products already will retain that pressure that we see physiologically. However, there's a problem, and this is actually a problem with other products on the market. It can be too runny. And so then you don't have accurate application in the body where you need it the most. And then if you have it too viscous, it cures and it's too thick, and then you're changing um, the overall mechanics and the response of these materials. So next we move to our Band-Aid. And we use different fabrication techniques to get this dry patch. And the idea is when you slapped it on that hole over the lung, it would hydrate because of all the fluid in our body. But then we would be able to cross-link it by applying that green light, which you can see um, in that bottom image. Again, we looked at burst pressure. Again, we were doing great. In particular, we have one winner, right? This one's doing great. Um, but we're able to change the dimensions of these band-aids. And um, the other accomplishment is because they're dry, they have more of a stable storage than something that's in water. And importantly, it remains in place while we are cross-linking the material. So it's not running and going all over the place. However, they are very brittle when they come out if we want them to be very thin. And so we thought there's something better that we can do. Um, the other thing I would like to mention is going into biology, we can also take this material, um, particularly this patch, and if we encapsulate a chemotherapeutic, we have shown that we can get sustained death of cancer cells by putting the chemotherapeutic in our patch and then putting the patch in culture with cells. So there's definitely room to expand on any of these materials for the medical industry. So last but not least, let's talk about this powder sealant. Now this is a big deal because um, anyone can sort of put powder on something, right? Anyone who has worked with cornmeal, baby powder, flour, what have you, we know how powder flows. We know um, how much to put on by how much we're sprinkling it, right? Like a lot of people know what to do with powder. And uh, one of our goals was to obtain a precise application. That is how we're going to ensure functionality of our material. Um, the other nice thing about powder is as you're laying it down, right, it's able to very nicely cover uh, multiple different topographies, right? And it's able to contour to that substrate, which is very important, um, and also to remain in place. So we create a powder and we create um, a dry powder, right? It's not the most beautiful process. We use a mortar and pestle, but we had to start somewhere. And then on the right, you see these scanning electron images over powder. It's kind of flaky, actually doesn't look like cornmeal at all, but it's a place to start. Now, the most remarkable data that I want to show you is on the bottom right. And what we see is this in vivo data. So we actually went into animals and we wanted to test out this powder sealant, which by the way, no one has made a powder sealant that forms an elastic hydrogel. Okay, I'm not talking about something that is applied to clot 
what? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that is meant to be in a dynamic environment. And so if we look pre-injury, right, this is um, where we put pressure into a lung, and once we stop applying that pressure, we see that the lung is able to hold it. That's great, right? There's no hole. Once we induce an injury, essentially just poke that lung, you can see that after a certain amount of time, that air is able to escape and we lose pressure. But after sprinkling our powder over the defect, right, hitting it with some light, we are able to restore um, both the pressure of the lung and then what's not shown is that dynamic response. So it's very exciting. Um, so now let's get onto my other project. I see that I'm sort of running out of time, but this is super fun, but also depressing. Um, so what is available out there is this thing called an animal kill clock, and you can find it at animalclock.org. But essentially what I'm showing is as of 9 a.m. this morning, 48 billion animals have been killed in the United States for meat products. And so what does that boil down to? Well, after we are done talking today from 12 to 1 p.m., a total of 6 million animals would have been slaughtered for meat production alone. And so meat production, um, even if you have personal feelings toward it, it is unfriendly to our environment. That we cannot argue, we cannot argue with the facts. And so as we look at um, each day for meat production, you can see we're using um, large amounts of water, right, for these animals. We are taking up a lot of land and that land requirement is increasing all over the world. You can see that we're releasing CO2 and then antibiotics are being used, which make it into our water systems. And so the image on the bottom right, this is from a company that comes from Europe. We can see the idea, the idea is can we take cells from an animal without harming the animal take those cells, grow them up in a lab, much like we would do for tissue engineering, and culture it in a way so that it looks like meat, tastes like meat, and we can actually consume that meat, okay? That is one of the challenges that we have. And so transforming meat culture, there's two things that I wanna talk about real, real briefly. And so on the left, you can see this image actually um, is taken from people who are, uh, changing the milk industry, right? But instead of having all those dairy cows stuck being milked day in and day out, the idea is can we take something from a cow without harming that cow, reduce all of those cows that are producing the milk and can we actually make the milk in the lab using enzymes? So taking that technology and moving it to the meat um, market, right? Is we would take samples from the cow itself we would grow it up in culture and we would be able to do this on a mass production scale to, repli to replace traditional animal agriculture. And the idea again for creating these scaffolds is we are going to use alginate because of all of the reasons that I mentioned before. And so in summary, I just wanna remind everyone that my goal is to sound like that symphony. At times we sound like a struggling rock band in my garage, but that's where we have to start. And what's important is that we retain our passion for our research. And again, that is preventing medical trauma. That is an NIH R01 funded project. Transforming meat culture. So I have an amazing new student, Irfan Tahir, who has brought this industry to my attention. So we're currently looking for funding. And then bio-waste textiles, we can talk about that at another time. And so this is my second to last um, slide, but um, this phrase that I came up with um, when I was looking at that powder project is to create simple solutions um, that create heroes among us. And so the idea, again, um, an awful scenario, but if you have a child and a mother who are in a car accident and something needs to be done, even as first responders are on the way, is it possible for even our children to be able to take a product that you can get off the market, a powder, and they can sprinkle that onto a wound and you are able to help save that person's life? That's the idea, is that anyone can save a life. Anyone can save the environment if we give them really simple tasks, right? Really simple solutions. And so I do wanna thank all of you. I'm gonna go ahead and flip to my last slide because I didn't do most of this work, right? My students did. And I love working with the students. That is why I'm in academia and I'm not pursuing um, industrial positions, but certainly we need 
people inside and outside of academia to actually carry this work forward. Um, and I do believe that one of the challenges is um, communicating the science and making people trust us. Um, but I wanna thank you. I wanna thank everyone in all of the labs that helped do this work. If you want more information on the work that we do on our funding sources and on the students who are actually making it happen, please check out my website. We have wonderful and useful things to say on Twitter. And again, I would like to thank my funding sources and thank all of you today. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that fascinating talk. I think mm -hmm. we'll have um, a lot to continue with in our Q&A. And we already have a few questions, so we'll dive into those. I do want to remind everyone that you can submit your questions uh, in the Q&A box. So we'll get started here. We have a question from Taylor Ricketts, who says, yes. fascinating talk. How do you decide what natural species to begin to work with? Do you screen for millions of natural materials to begin working with a few? Is there a formal process for that screening? So in the screening, are you referring to um, the alginate that we source? Um, I'm gonna assume that the answer is yes. Uh, I, can't, I, I haven't opened up the chat, but um, it comes just by chance, to be honest. Um, the use of alginate came from when I was a postdoc at the University of Washington. I was surrounded by people that were using plastics and I came upon some work of other investigators and they were looking into using alginate. And I also want to um, let everyone know that chitazan, right, which comes from crustaceans. So um, it's actually a bio waste. People have been investigating that for a long time as well. Um, Rui Reese from Portugal is one of the leaders in that field and have actually made medical products and brought them to market. So using, using things like alginate, um, I've just become more and more excited about because of aquaculture and the fact that things like that are taking place in the Northeast. Um, I do think a lot of solutions can start with us at home in our backyards and so that's just one of my motivators is to um, just take what I know and run with it. But if someone has a suggestion, well, I'll work with that as well. Thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Meredith Niles. It says, thanks, Rachel. This has been fascinating. I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the challenges we and you face with scaling up these solutions. Is it a manufacturing barrier, economic, it costs more? What are the challenges that you see for scaling up? That is a great question. Um, first, I will answer that in a general sense. So as both a mechanical engineer and a biomedical engineer, in order for something to go to market and in order for it to be purchased and used by people, it needs to be simple, cheap, um, and able to be mass produced, right? And so for some of these things that we're talking about, um, a lot of it is communication to the end user. So for medical products, um, you know, uh, clinicians are nervous to move away from something that they know, right? And that makes sense, but it's communicating to that consumer. As far as the transforming, uh, you know, the meat industry, it's again, communicating that to the consumer. Um, and I hate to say this, but I think that some of the solutions that we will find is to not give the consumer a choice, right? And so if I go into the um, grocery store and I see all those meat alternatives, it's maybe a space of two feet where I look on either side of that and you have 20 feet of pork and beef products. Um, I think the, the manufacturing, yes, ecological, absolutely. Because if you don't have people buying the product, you don't have income for trying to research these things. And so it really is cyclical. It really is. I don't have a single answer to that solution, but there are problems. Um, but we are, we are trying to overcome both the consumer roadblock and the, um, eco, uh, the economical roadblock. Great. Our next question is from Donna Rizzo. Hi, Rachel. Great talk. 
I know that one of your goals in developing simple solutions for medical products is to make products that are safe for the environment and cost effective. Have you done any type of cost analysis for any of these products that includes the externalities, like the cost saved in protecting the environment? Yeah, that is a great question. I haven't done a cost analysis um, on using alginate overall, right? Any of the um, market analysis, um, the end revenue that I have done has been on particular products, right? So on a one sealant. Um, I think overall using bees like this, it's relatively cheap. It is so much cheaper than if you look at the supply chain for some of the traditional products, you're talking about getting oil, refining oil, taking those byproducts, polymerizing something, it's toxic to the environment, anyone who's driven out west, right? Um, it's terrible, it's terrible. It, it costs a lot of money to go through that process. However, alginate is probably the cheapest thing we use in my lab, right? Which again is another motivator to use it, but it is really inexpensive compared to some of the traditional materials. And so, I think if we look at alginate um, and we look at using alginate as part of manufacturing of medical products or these meat alternatives, um, that helps to reduce the cost overall because it really is a cheap product. It's reproducible, right? It's sustainable. Um, and so if we, if we can just incorporate that more into those fields and really start to have some success, um, I think that will make a big difference and people will accept it economically. Elizabeth has a question for you. She is asking, if alginate use becomes more popular, is there any worry of over harvesting it? Do you know what the implications of this would be? And I'm from Maine and have friends who are interested in this kind of uh, venture going forward. So I'm very curious <laughs> to hear what you think. Yeah, um, I've thought about that a little bit, right? And I think that in particular, Maine, they have gone from doing some of the aqua um, agriculture, right? Looking at mussels, looking at scallops, lobsters, that type of stuff, and moving more towards um, kelp farming. Um, I do want to remind everyone that alginate has been in use in our um, society for a long time, in particular for food. And many of you probably don't even know it, right? We don't give you a choice. Um, but it has, it, it has been accepted in our society. It's being used for that reason. Now, if we start to use alginate a lot more for let's say the medical industry, um, I'm not sure what impact that would have on our environment. Um, I'm sure that it would, um, it would take up space, right? It would use some resources, but if you look at a balance, are we doing better than what we were doing before, right? I think that finding a solution overall to where we're doing no harm, this true cradle to cradle design, um, I think it's, it's, it's a staircase, it really is. And so I think using alginate absolutely is better than taking something that's not sustainable. Um, also, I will say that Maine is only um, second to the world's largest um, alginate producer or kelp producer, and that is from the Netherlands. And so um, they have a system over there where it's pretty sustainable. Um, they've actually been bought up by a lot of larger companies. And so I, I guess in essence, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the right answer to that question, but I do think it would be less harmful than other things that we're using. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Tim Chur, he says, thanks and great talk. And also asks, uh, there are groups looking to grow kelp or other microalgaes on a massive scale as a gigaton scale climate solution by sinking the stocks into the deep ocean. How much of a kelp plant is alginate? Could you continue storing most of the carbon from a kelp after extracting the alginate? Oh my goodness, that is such a great question. So that is where I unfortunately um, haven't gone into. So the extraction of alginate from kelp, I don't know because I haven't done it myself right, to really, to really understand that process. But we work with other um, nature source materials. So the other thing that I didn't talk about is aloe. 
Aloe is being discovered every day for its fantastic medicinal uses, right? Backed up by science um, from curing cancer to irritable bowel um, syndrome, right? So that process, if you take an aloe plant and you wanted to actually get any, um, so from a foot long aloe leaf, you get maybe 100 milligrams of useful material. If you take a peach pit, right? So this is um, in the bio waste project. If you take a peach pit, which is discarded as food waste, and you were to break that down, you would get 4% of that total weight um, back in lignin, which is another polymer that we're using. So it is not a very good return, um, but I am not sure what they do with the byproducts of that purification process. I would hope that there would be um, multi-uses for harvesting kelp. Great, thank you. Please send in any more questions you have, but I have an opening to ask you a few of my own, so I will <laughs> take that opportunity. I am interested in what kind of processes you have to undertake to ensure or test or not um, the safety of these products for healthcare for patients. Um, is that information you have already when you start using these materials or is that a step that happens well after you've developed uh, the product or the, the material? Um, and how, how are you involved in that kind of uh, research and that process? That's a great question. Um, whether it's for direct human use, human consumption, or even for textiles, the first thing we do is test the toxicity of our materials. Um, because if we are doing any chemical synthesis that is going to cause our materials to be toxic, why move on? Why even continue? And so almost at every stage of our production of these materials, we test the toxicity with human cells, with primary human cells. Um, we also do it with animal materials, but most of our work goes to the medical industry, not for veterinary care, although that's another area, right, of medical waste. Um, and so we most certainly test it. There is nothing that's going to go out of my lab that's going to um, cause more harm to living systems, at least human beings. Let's go with human beings and animals, mammals, mammals. I was really intrigued also by one of the applications of one of the products you mentioned, which was the, the Band-Aid version um, of the product. Uh, you mentioned that there was potential for anti-cancer treatment uh, with that product. And I'm curious how, how that proceeds. Is that something that your lab would pursue or once that is known, how does, how does that information reach the the next research stage? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for some of it, it's, it's a hurdle in just getting people to really understand what we're doing first, right? So if I was to propose um, a new Band-Aid or a new Post-it note, there would be a lot of pushback, right? Because a lot of people think that there's nothing wrong with what we're using right now. Um, but the Band-Aid was very exciting, right? That actually took off pretty quickly. I was able to get a lot of internal funding here to investigate what it would take to bring that to market. Um, but a lot of the hurdles are trying to find ways in which our material is different enough from those on the market that will make patent lawyers happy. And I do think that something I don't see that much in um, the biography of these patent reviewers is someone from the environment. I think that even a Band-Aid, right? If you were to break down our hydrogel Band-Aid compared to perhaps someone else's hydrogel Band-Aid, um, there may be differences in environmental effects. And so we are continuously trying to protect some of the IP that we have, uh, but at the end of the day, disclosing um, this information, right? Getting it to the public, getting other researchers to look at this, um, that won't necessarily hurt my feelings, right? Would I like to become a billionaire like Bob Lehner? Absolutely. But um, no, it's just people advancing this research and the next generation's carrying it on. That's, that's the most significant. Thank you. I want to share a comment from Taylor Ricketts as a 
a follow up and something to consider. He says, I think the the all in social cost analysis is an interesting idea from Donna. Net impacts on greenhouse gases, water use, embedded energy, etc especially for cultured meat. And that's a project that other members in Gund could help with. So exciting thing to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. Um, please email me if you can think of a way where you can contribute to our work or if you have further questions. Questions um, inspire solutions to problems we didn't even know existed, so. I have a, another follow-up question, uh, and this is related to the one that Meredith Niles asked about scaling up and is related to a comment you made about needing to uh, change the consumer, um, sort of to redesign the consumer. And I'm curious to hear how some of those consumers, you mentioned they might be physicians or clinicians, um, receive this kind of technology, these kinds of products, um, since they, they are different than what is currently out there um, from the medical side, if there's a certain level of mistrust that you face in, in terms of acceptability. I don't think it's mistrust. Um, I really respect those who are on the front lines and don't have a decision of, you know, what their equipment is made out of, right? Their number one goal is to save a life. And I respect that wholeheartedly. I think one of the ways to um, really have an impact on the medical industry is to make it easier for surgeons, clinicians to use. Because if you can make anything easier and quicker for them, they will adopt it. They will, even if it's different. And so that is a challenge, right? So even if our material doesn't perform better, is it easier for the surgeon to use? that will um, that will make a, a product more popular. Since we do have a few more minutes, I'm wondering, Rachel, if you would like to touch upon the third area of research that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, I think it was bio waste textiles, uh, which um, right now I don't, that doesn't mean a whole lot to me and I would love to learn a little more. Yes, so bio waste textiles. So bio waste is another problem, right? And so if we look annually in the US, we throw away something like 16, um, 16 billion animals worth of meat every year, right? So this bio waste, what can we get from food, right? Because our earth is able to recycle our food, right? Just like we compost it and it's able to use that stuff. So can we? So the idea is um, in bio waste, there are a lot of natural polymers, a lot, uh, very similar to those that are extracted from seaweed. So the idea is to take those polymers and replace those fossil fuel driven plastics that are in our clothing, for example. So if any of you are wearing a polyester shirt, that is not sustainable. And so our goal is, can we create textiles for camping gear, for clothing, that is um, produced from bio waste, thus having less of an impact on our environment. That is a fascinating concept um, and is perhaps related to uh, the area of research just above transforming meat culture. Uh, it seems as though there would be a fair bit of culture shift around uh, accepting what types of uh, raw materials we use to make otherwise common, um, commonly found products and materials. Um, yeah. All right. Great. Um, I'm not able to open my Zoom. I'm so sorry. Oh, I just realized I can, okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We go. Took me a while. <laughs> We have another question from Meredith Niles, yeah. who asks, how do you get people to want to wear shirts from old medical waste or other bio waste? Definitely some consumer perceptions to overcome there. Right. Yeah. What are your what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So my thoughts are um, I would want to talk to the people who came up with toilet paper. Right. That comes from reused paper like 
if you can get people to buy that, I bet you can get people to wear shirts. And again, um, I bet most of you do not know what is on the tag on the shirt that you're wearing. And so if you don't think about it, right, you don't, you don't know whether it's good or it's bad. And so can we incorporate some of these textiles into everyday commodities where people don't even have to think about it? Um, but it is comparable to the clothing that's made out of hemp. Right, and so there's a population that wears the hemp clothes, and then there's a population that doesn't wear the hemp clothes, and so just trying to uh, get more people to accept this. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, that seems to go back to your comment about um, not just redesigning healthcare, redesigning um, some of these products themselves, but redesigning the consumer in some ways and. Yes. and what choices are available. Yes. Great. Oops, here we go. Uh, we have a question from Elizabeth. Do you have any idea what the cost of the clothes would be for the consumers? Oh, it would be higher. It would. Um, but so again, if we're designing a product, that product's going to be for a particular market. And my student who introduced some of this work to me, um, this idea to me uh, compares it to a company like Patagonia, where people are willing to spend more money on stuff that is less harmful to the environment, right? And so, yes, it would cost more, but we would start uh, with people who are willing to pay more. Great. We have a question from Bailey Rowland. How have any of your lab's medical trauma products been tested or used clinically? Oh, great question. No, only preclinical, preclinical work. Um, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with um, me trying to get some of my collaborators on board and then sort of shifting it over to them, right? I like to really take take a step back, right? Not even like almost be the conductor who is like below everyone else's seats, right? And all you see are the instruments. Um, that's sort of my, my more comfortable space. And so the clinical tests, I don't even know if, I don't, I don't think I would be even in charge of that, but no, I don't have enough money. <laughs> to do a clinical test. That's where I would need this IP to be licensed to a company that has the funding to support a clinical trial. Yeah. Great, and related to that question and to a comment you made earlier about the transdisciplinarity of your work, uh, who do you see as those kinds of partners that um, you currently do work with and, and would want to be working with to help uh, bring these products um, the whole way? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would love to have more business savvy people on my side. I would love to have more um, IP savvy people on my side. But right now I have an incredible uh, list of collaborators, right? They come from plant biology, they come from Department of Medicine, they come from chemistry, they come from the Department of Pathology. Um, I really do think that to come up with a solution, you need to have people from various backgrounds. Um, and uh, you know, on top of that, I got a certificate from the University of Vermont, right? Trying to increase diversity and inclusion. And I think that's important even for PIs, right? When we're looking at collaborative projects. So I like talking to a wide range of people um, to take information from them, but also maybe to help them with their own products or research. Great point. We have time for one last question. If there are any out there listening who would like to take this opportunity to do pop one in the Q&A box. I'll give it just a minute in case any last ones come in. But I think that that is actually a, a great note to close on. Um, Thank you so much, Rachel, for your presentation and 
I want to, on behalf of the Gund Institute, thank you and everyone who joined us online and for the great questions. <clears throat> we'll have the video and a podcast of today's talk available next week. And uh, this is our last Gund exchange for the semester. We, we will be hosting a session next Monday, November 23rd at 1.15 p.m. called Cross-Sector Partnerships for Developing and Scaling Food Systems Solutions in the Northeast U.S. in partnership with, a ben and Jerry's, uh, with Ben and Jerry's Food as a Force for Good event. Uh, so please join us if you can. Thank you all, and we'll see you then. Thank you so much. Bye.